Okay, so the first topic that we're going to talk about this morning has to do with, you know, what's going on around here? What's happening to these horses here in New York? Um, is it different than what happens to racehorses in other jurisdictions? Uh, is there something that's, is there a commonality about these injuries, something we could set as a priority so we could focus our efforts to make a, a, a difference here? What we're trying to do, of course, is reduce injury. And so we're going to start with looking at the post-mortem examination findings of the horses that died at New York racetracks between 2013 and 2015. That's a three-year period, and we're going to review that information for you to give you an idea about what happens. I mean, I'm sure you've seen horses taken away in an ambulance. Sadly, I'm sure some of you have had up close and personal experiences with this, but it's very important that, you, that everybody has an idea about what's happening out there, and this is the other side of the story. After the horse is taken away from the racetrack, what do we find? What's going on? Okay, now this got started back at Aqueduct in 2012 and 13, and as part of the, uh, the governor of New York uh, asked four of us to take a look at the situation at Aqueduct back then and figure out what was happening. There were 21 horses that died in a three-week period of time there, and uh, we were asked to figure out what happened there and make some recommendations to fix it. So with that, one of the things that we did was we said, well, we really need a, a post-mortem program because if we don't have any, any idea what happened to these horses from a medical standpoint, there's no way we can possibly tell what happened to them and, and give intelligent recommendations to anybody about preventing these things in the future. So the very first step in the process was to find out what was going on with these horses. Okay, so we're going to look here at a, a, a group of horses. Now, these are, these are only Naira horses. Now, there, we had some horses from Finger Lakes, but because we are at a Naira racetrack, because you are participating in the Naira program, I thought it would be important to restrict this data to what's exactly happening in our racetrack so you can see what's going on. Now, first of all, this is a graph that shows the age distribution of the horses that were submitted for postmortem examinations. And if you look at this chart, it fairly accurately represents the general population at our racetracks. The one possible exception to this, and I admit we have to do a little more work to figure this out, is I think that it's possible that the two-year-old representation is a little low here. And, and that, I say that because we do know from other research that we've done that two-year-olds are not commonly injured out on that racetrack. So the fact that we have a very low number of two-year-olds here may in some part reflect the fact that two-year-olds represent a smaller part of the general population, but it may also represent the fact that they're not as likely to be injured. So we keep that in the back of your mind. But I, would, I, I mentioned that point to you so you understand that when we do anything with research, we, we constantly reevaluate our findings as we go along because our initial impressions sometimes are incorrect, we get more data, and we, we modify our interpretations, and so it's a growing uh, process. And so this is just an example of that. The gender distribution probably would not surprise you. It's a pretty typical gender distribution of horses at Naira racetracks and every other racetrack. The one thing that surprised me a little bit when we looked at this information was that we have some, some good experimental data from Tim Parkin who analyzes the equine injury database to show that intact male horses are more likely to be injured than any other type of gender. And I was a little surprised, therefore, when we found this in our study here, but it just goes to show we're looking at a very specific population of horses, and it may not be exactly the same population as, as the entire nation, for example. Now, this would not come as a surprise to you either, that a vast majority of our horses are injured during exercise. There are a small percentage of horses that, that have colic, or they have accidents in the barn area or whatever, but by far, you know, the majority of our cases here, and we're really talking about almost 90% of the horses um, are exercise-related injuries. Now this chart shows uh, some interesting things, and what it shows here is, is you can see that the blue bars represent injuries that occurred during training exercise. Those are morning injuries, if you will. And then the red bars represent racing injuries. Those are the afternoon injuries. And if you look at this chart, it's it, one of the first things that you can see, we have the period from 2010 through 2015. Now this represents the first three years, 2010, 11, and 12, represent the three years before the task force report and before we started being very aggressive about trying to reduce fatalities in New York. The last three years, 13, 14, and 15, represent the years after the task force report, after we'd implemented a lot of interventions, after the horsemen, the veterinarians, and the racetrack operators, and the commission all had made changes in their policies and protocols to reduce injuries. And if you look at this chart, 
it's pretty obvious that the red bars have, have changed quite a bit. After 2012, 13, 14, and 15, these injuries decreased dramatically, almost 40 percent, the racing injuries. But if you look at the blue bars, the training injuries really didn't decrease that much. They decreased about 6 percent. So I was very naive in the beginning, and I thought anything that we would do to reduce racing injuries would equally help to reduce training injuries. But in fact, I was wrong about that. Because as you can see from this chart, we've been very successful in reducing racing injuries in the last four years now, but because this trend has continued. But we have not been successful as much in reducing training injuries. And that's a subject that we'll talk about a little later. I think it's also, this is a, uh, it's very important we talk about the rates of injury that we talk about a, a, a level of exposure. In other words, if we said well, we, had, we had 17 injuries at Aqueduct this, this meet so far, and people compare that number with other racetracks and, and other years for Saratoga, it's really, care you have to be very careful in making comparisons like that because there can be other variables that can enter into the equation. This, for example, is a chart that shows a comparison between racing injury and training injury. Because I just got done telling you we have not been able to reduce the training injury rate very much, and yet if we look at this chart, what we can see is that the, the actual risk of a horse being having a fatal musculoskeletal injury while training is really not as high as it is during racing. The white bars on this chart represent training fatalities, and the red bars represent racing fatalities. Okay, so from this, what we this, you'll notice at the top here though we have a it says Perth 1,000 events. So our racing fatality rates, the Jockey Club and New York measure these things in terms of exposure. So we talk about numbers of fatalities per 1,000 starts. That's the denominator. You have to have a denominator in order to make sense out of this data and compare it from year to year or from track to track. So if we have racing calculated as number of fatalities per race start, then the, the, the other tr thing we have to do is figure out what we can do about training. How can, we, how can we get a denominator for training? So what I did was I went to the jockey club and asked them to give me a report in this period of time of all the, the reported workouts, all the recorded workouts that occurred in New York. And with that data, then I was able to calculate numbers of fatalities per training event. So this gives us an accurate comparison of the risk of a horse being injured out there on the training track versus the racetrack, and it's about half. It's actually what we have here in these numbers is that the risk, in, during this period of time, the risk of racing fatalities, it was 1.7 fatalities per 1,000 starts. The risk of having a training fatality was 0 0.7 per 1,000 training efforts. So it's, it's much less likely that a horse is going to get injured while training than racing, and I'm sure you can understand the obvious reasons for that, that they're not performing the same kind of activity, they're not going as fast, they're not going as far. It's a, it's a very different situation. But that gives it, that's, that's really the first time we've ever had data that could really give you an idea about what the risk, relative risk is between racing and training. Now, we have all kinds of, of fatalities here that we're calculating. This is not just racing fatalities, but this, this, the jockey club only counts racing fatalities. We count racing fatalities, training fatalities, and non-exercise fatalities. So any horse that dies is in this chart here. And what you can see by that chart is that 52% of these fatalities occurred at Belmont Park. Well, that doesn't mean that Belmont Park is a dangerous place or a more dangerous place than Aqueduct or Saratoga because we have a lot more going on at Belmont Park than we do at these other tracks. And if you look at the number of starts, uh, for example, well, Aqueduct's pretty big, but Aqueduct and Belmont equally represented about 40% of the total starts and Saratoga only 19%. So, so there is a big difference between the number of starts at Saratoga and at these other tracks. And so when we look at this data, we have to interpret that. So this, this just is a representation, though, that, that indicates that we have, we have fatalities at all the racetracks. And it's not exactly the same. There's some variation in the data. It's not a uniform distribution across all these tracks. If we look at racing fatalities alone per 1,000 starts from 2009 to 2016, this is an eight-year period, and the, the blue line represents Aqueduct, the green line represents Belmont, and the red line represents Saratoga. Now, I put this slide up here to give you some idea. Now, there, there's an awful lot of news coverage and a lot of media attention on Saratoga, of course, for obvious reasons. But I want you to, to be able to put this all in perspective a bit. And if you look at this fatality rate over an eight-year period, what do you see? Well, it varies a little bit from time to time, for sure. We had the biggest bump was in 2014, actually, and but and then it was down in 2015 and 16. So it's it's a, I think it's just important to put Saratoga in the proper perspective that it's really not there's nothing crazy going on here, 
but, but because it's a very compressed meet, we're racing six days a week, we have about, we're averaging about 543 starts a week at Saratoga. That's an incredible number of starts per week. And it's because of that compressed format that we can have more injuries here and it becomes very alarming. But I'm not saying that we're, these are not important. Don't get me wrong. I just want to point out to you that we have to be very careful when we talk about relative risk of tr different tracks and, and when we have all this media attention that people understand that some of the uh, clustering of these injuries has to do with literally just with exposure. And when you have so many races in such a short period of time that that can skew the data a little bit. Now, if we look at the injuries according to the surfaces, this probably wouldn't surprise you, but th this proportion is pretty much the national proportion of the number of races that are run on turf and dirt, the relative number. Now, I know you're thinking, well, we're running a lot more turf races these past few years, and that's true. But by and large, if you look at the data all for the whole year long, this is the percentage. It's about 80% dirt and about 20% turf. So that reflects, there's nothing, it's not as though that the dirt is that much more dangerous, according to this data, anyway, in terms of, of the turf. So now let's talk a little bit about diagnoses. Of all the things, of all the horses that died in that period of time and went to Cornell, 80% of them were musculoskeletal fractures. And I, I'm sure that doesn't surprise you either, but you might be interested to know what about the rest of them. Um, cardiovascular represents not only heart situations, but a horse, some of these horses die of exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage. So every uh, one of those horses in that chart is not necessarily a heart issue, but it could be a pulmonary issue as well, or it could be a ruptured blood vessel. So there are a few things in there that can be grouped together as cardiovascular. Colic is, a, is, a, is something we see here certainly now and again. A respiratory disease. Now these horses are really sick horses. You know, obviously respiratory disease is very common at the racetrack, but these horses are really sick, mostly pneumonia cases you know, is what you see there. Central nervous system is pretty rare, um, but it happens once in a while. It's that, those are EPM cases or other types of central, we had, we had one case of encephalitis one year. So there's some, some central nervous system disorders, but it's a very small percentage. So what is this, so what? What's the importance of this? If we look at this slide, what does this tell us? It tells us that if we're gonna try and reduce the total number of fatalities in New York, where are we going to put our efforts? Where are we going to put, what is, what's going to be our priority? Musculoskeletal, right? That's where we're going to work. So that's one of the benefits of this program. It helps us to focus our attention in certain areas. Now, we're not done with prioritizing just yet. So now we're going to look at, these are just fractures of the, of the limb, the leg fractures alone. And out of these horses, there's a pretty even balance between left front and right front. Um, and there is a, a, a huge difference between front and back. You know, it's about 90% front end, about 10% hind end. Probably not a surprise to you based upon your experience, but we can put numbers on this so we can measure this from time to time to see if there, there are changes in this percentage as we go through, through the different meets because different types of injuries can mean different things to us in terms of causes. So it's important to be able to, to characterize this. If we talk about an axial fatal musculoskeletal injury, FMSI means fatal musculoskeletal injury. If we look at the axial fractures, these are pelvis, skull, and cervical fractures, and they're very different. They're very small numbers here we're talking about. We only had eight of those cases in the three-year period. Uh, the cervical fractures, honestly, are, are largely from steeplechase races, where horses do rotational falls over the fences and experience cervical fractures. It's, it's a very uncommon injury in the flat racing. Um, pelvis fractures. Uh, pelvis fractures are most likely seen, and I'm not sure we know exactly why, but mares or fillies are more likely to have pelvic fractures than colts or geldings uh, or horses. And it also is a, is a type of injury that's more often seen on the turf than on the dirt. So it's, it's a little bit of a weird one in terms of its epidemiology. Skull fractures pretty much are horses that rear up and fall over backwards. And it happens sometimes. We had one last year that was walking um, over to the assembly barn and was, was uh, overstimulated in that process. Two grooms on the horse. Uh, they were not able to control the horse. The horse reared up, went over backwards, fractured her skull on the walking area on, outside the racetrack. So that's what that represents. It's very rare, again, for a horse to have a skull fracture other than a fall. That's, what, that's how they happen. Okay, now if we're gonna look, this is, we're digging down a little deeper in, this, in the data here, and we're looking at the kinds of injuries that happen in these limbs. 
Now, what we can pretty clearly see here is that the, th the three most important ones are clearly the carpal injuries. These are slab fractures, pretty much, or, or comminuted fractures of the carpal bones, meaning they're broken into many pieces. Cannon bone fractures include both what we call diaphyseal or mid-shaft fractures. Those, those are the ones right in the middle of the bone where they break apart. And they, but more commonly, we have what we call condylar fractures, which represent a fracture that begins in the fetlock joint and moves up the leg from there. We're going to take a closer look at those in a minute. And sesamoid fractures are our number one cause of death. Now, these fractures, this is the same pattern that's seen in racetracks in California or any other part of the country. Kentucky, it's all the same, that the, the fetlock joint is the main area we need to work in. So we, we, we learned from our earlier slide that we're going to be focusing on the musculoskeletal system. We also saw from an earlier slide we're going to be focusing on the front legs. And we also saw from this slide that we really want to be looking at the fetlock joint. So we've, this, we've gone from a very brush broad stroke down to a very specific area. So if we're going to make a difference in the musculoskeletal fatality rate in New York, we need to be focusing on the fetlock joint. That's the bottom line. So we've, I've kind of walked you through that process about how we get to that point. But that's the story. We have to be focusing on the fetlock joint. Now, this fetlock joint is a complex joint. It's obviously the joint that bends the most. And this joint hyperextends into the, into the track. We're going to see some pictures of that in a little while. But this is a, this is a very complex joint. It really undergoes a tremendous amount of load with the horse. And we're going to look at the anatomy of that as we go along. But that's the area where we need to be focusing. That's the area as a veterinarian that I need to be looking at. That's the area as a horse trainer you need to be looking at. Because these are the areas that cause all the trouble. Absolutely number one. What about these cardiac things? You know, we have horses out on the racetrack that will complete a race, and they don't really ever do it during the race. It's after the race. They can be walking back. They can fall down in the winter circle, which is really unfortunate, of course. They can also uh, be walking back or galloping out and collapse on the racetrack, and it's, it's a nightmare. You may remember the Preakness two years ago that a horse died after walking out of the winter circle at the Preakness on Preakness Day. So what, what's going on with that? And, and why in New York, it, between 2013 and 14 and 15, did we have such a disproportionately high number of cardiac deaths at New York racetracks? You know, what's the explanation for this? I think it's very, very important that we look at data like this and try and figure this out and, and make some kind of a change to stop it. So let's take a look at what's going on here. So the horse's autonomic nervous system, this is the part of your nervous system and the horse's nervous system that you don't think about. It just works autonomically, automatically. It's, it's, the, it's the part of the nervous system that controls your breathing rate. It's the part of the nervous system that controls your heart rate. And it really has two components. It has the calm part of you, and it has the excited part of you. We all have moments when we're excited. We all have moments when we're calm and quiet. When you're calm and quiet, your heart rate's slow. The parasympathetic part of the system takes over. When you're excited, we have a flight or fight reaction. We get upset about something, or we're scared about something, or we're exercising. Then, then the uh, sympathetic part takes over and kicks up our heart rate, constricts our pupils, and prepares us for exercise or, or self-defense. But anyway, at a resting heart rate for a horse, it's going to be between 30 and 40 beats per minute. That's because the vagus nerve is, is quite active in this, in this exercise part. In the, when the horse is out on the racetrack, his heart rate goes from 30 to 40 to 220 beats a minute or more. That's an incredible change. There's very few species of animals that can do that. And the horse is one of them. It's an, really an incredible increase. After the race is over, though, then, then things start to quiet down. The jockeys are galloping out these horses. And right off the bat, the heart rate starts to come down a little bit. And in a very fit horse, it comes down more quickly than it does with a horse that's not fit. But that process of slowing down the heart from going from 220 beats per minute to 40 beats per minute is a transitional phase. Sort of like when you're putting the brakes on your car, you're going from, from 65 miles an hour down to 30 miles an hour for village speed limit. There's a transition period there. And during that transition period, horses that have heart attacks, instead of having a nice smooth transition, have an irregular transition. It's a stepwise change where the heart rate goes, goes along at a certain rate, drops down 10 beats or so, goes along for a rate, drops down 10 beats or so. A normal horse has a nice smooth decline in heart rate. So, what causes that? I mean, is there something that goes on with the autonomic nervous system about these horses? Is it genetic? Could be. Is there, is there fibrosis in their heart muscles? Sometimes there is. Is there disruption of the Purkinje fibers that transmit energy through the heart? Sometimes there is. Sometimes we, we've even found in one horse an abnormal cardio, a coronary artery 
in a horse located that's known to cause sudden death in human marathon athletes, but we'd never seen it in a horse until a couple of years ago, the first time we found one of those. So there can be some explanations, but sometimes not. But there are some things, though, that can contribute to this imbalance of the autonomic nervous system, and they include things like electrolyte imbalance. Now, electrolyte imbalance in a hot summer day is a big deal. As you all know, we give Lasix to a lot of these horses. That can contribute to this. Just in terms of the uh, electrolytes, dehydration could have some underlying cardiac disease, but uh, diuretics, hormones, heavy metals, cobalt can also contribute to this irregularity. In 2014, um, was the year when we started seeing a lot of cobalt in the horses in the drug testing. And we put out a, uh, it was here at Saratoga, in the middle of Saratoga meet, we'd started to see a big increase through the Belmont meet at Naira of cardiac injuries, and or cardiac deaths, sudden cardiac deaths. And then we got up here at Saratoga, we had a few more. And because it takes a long time to get a rule change in New York, as equine medical director, I put it on an advisory that you, I'm sure, remember that said basically we're testing for cobalt and it, cobalt was a, 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 a supplement that, that you get every, every day and in low doses, it's great, it's no problem. It's, it's in B15, it's in B12, it's in B complex. A little cobalt's a good thing. But if you give pure straight cobalt to horses, it, it's an overload situation and it can, and can really cause some trouble with this autonomic nervous system. So I asked uh, Dr. Malin to do a survey of 200 horses at Naira. What we did was we took some TCO2 blood and just looked at 200 horses, and the average cobalt concentration in these Naira horses was 18 parts per billion. Now, that number is not important, but then we put out an advisor who said, we're testing for this, and uh, we believe that it can, it's, it's an equine welfare issue, that horses are dying from, from overuse of this uh, treatment, and that uh, the penalty for having a positive cobalt test will be a 10-year suspension. And that happened in July of 2014, and then I had Dr. Malin do another test of 200 horses at random at Naira racetracks in the fall. And the cobalt level in those horses in that group went from 18 parts per billion to 0 0.4 parts per billion. Okay, so that pretty much told me that cobalt is, is not being overused at this point. And lo and behold, you know, we had the, the fatalities uh, pretty much got back down into the more normal range again. So I'm not saying that's the whole story, but it's just an example of, of how we use this information sometimes in a regulatory sense to influence medical treatments in horses that can actually save lives. And that's a very important thing to understand. Okay, so how, how do we use this information that we get from the post-mortem examinations? And we really use it in a couple of different ways. In terms of a regulatory matter, we can use this to, to modify existing medication rules, if we think that that can be helpful. We changed the claiming rules in 2012, uh, 2013, and we're looking at doing that again. You probably heard about that, that we're looking at modifying the claiming rules once again to provide additional protection there. We um, started asking people to submit treatments on joint injections through the ESAL program. We've talked a lot about medical records and how to manage that sensitive issue of how do you balance um, confidentiality and professional medical records with the uh, ability to share them with other people, for example, when horses change hands. And uh, here at, this, at the Saratoga, we, we took out the last fence in the steeplechase race. <laughs> now, I know that might not sound like a lot, but it did decrease steeplechase fatalities because at the, at the end of a steeplechase race, the horses are tired. They're usually, the races are at least two miles long. When they're coming into that last fence, especially its location, they're coming into that fence at an angle. They're race riding through the fence, and these horses are exhausted a lot of times. And, and the fatality rate over the last fence in a steeplechase course and an urban steeplechase course was twice as high as any other fence in the course. So I recommended to the NSA that they remove that fence, and they did. So what happens now is that the race starts out there. They'll jump that first fence in the front stretch. They'll jump the second fence in the front stretch, and those two fences then fold away, and they'll jump. You know, when they go around the back stretch, they'll have had four. Then they do two more in the back, and it's a three-eighths of a mile sprint to the finish. And so it's changed steeplechase racing in an urban environment. We still, as you obviously are aware, if you've been here this meet, know that we still have problems with steeplechase fatalities, but that's been a big help anyway. So we're, we're doing what we can to move forward with that to make that a safer sport here in New York. Uh, we use these findings for research. Um, epidemiology is a, a word that I never paid much attention to when I was a surgeon for 38 years, but when I got into this job, it became my life. And epidemiology is the study of population medicine. You look at big populations of horses. We don't treat individual patients. We treat populations of patients. It's a different perspective. And you use this information from the necropsy program to help us shape our studies so we can have the biggest impact. We've only got so much money. We've only got so much time. So let's spend that money, spend that time on the things that really matter. 
So that's why this information helps us guide our research. And so we're, we're using this to document the scope and frequency of fatal musculoskeletal injury. That's step one, because if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. I don't care whether you're talking about your business, your family, or, or horse racing. We have to be able to measure these things. We have to develop ways to identify horses of interest. Nobody likes to use the term horses at increased risk of injury, right? We don't want to be racing horses that have increased risk of injury. Nobody consciously does that. But can we, can we agree, though, that there, some horses are more of more interest than others and maybe get, need, deserve a little bit better scrutiny if we're going to really help to identify some of these terrible injuries before they happen? So we're looking, we're calling these horses of interest. And then we get to design in for interventions. This is the core of our quality control program in New York. And what a quality control program is, whether you're working in a factory or whether you're working at the racetrack, is we have an objective, and our objective is to reduce and minimize fatalities. We'd like to get rid of them completely. Probably not going to happen, but we can get as close as we can. You know, somebody said to me once, it's not realistic for you, Doc, to be talking about getting fatalities down to zero. Have any of you re read a book by Stephen Covey called The, High the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? or ever heard of it, it's a, it's a, it's a well-known book where it's a self-help book to help people get organized in their life and, and, and live a greater life and be more productive. Well, Stephen Covey did never write a book called The Seven Habits of Moderately Successful People. He went for the, he went for the top end, he went for the highly successful people. That's what we're doing here. Our goal is, is perfection, we'll, we'll never get there, but we've got to keep striving for it. So that's kind of what we're doing here. Now, once we design an intervention from this program and we put it in place, we're not done. We have to test that intervention, and the test is we put it in place and we see what happens. And over a period of time, if we have enough time to evaluate it, we say either this is working or it's not working, meaning we'll do more of it, we'll, we'll keep it in place, or we'll get rid of it and do something else. So it's a constant, every day it's an evaluation, certainly every year it's an evaluation, but that's the program that we use to determine the interventions. We test them and then we, we recalibrate every, every time we move along. So, the Equine Safety Review Board is the review board that reviews these mortalities. And what we do is this is not a blame game. Now, I know there was a lot of fear about that back in 2012 or 13. Trainers were scared to death that we were going to blame trainers for these fatalities. And that's not what this is about. This is about learning together. I mean, we are in this together. I never talk about you and me. I talk about we because we are in this together. We all want the same thing. We all want to be successful. We all want our horses to be successful. We all want them healthy. A dead horse doesn't make any money. It's a really bad business event, right? And so we don't want these things to happen, and we're in this together to do whatever we can to make it ha uh, limit that. So what we try and do is we review the circumstances. We look at everything. We look at the horse's history of exercise from the moment he started his first recorded workout until he died. We look at his, his, his history of being claimed. We look at all the trainers that he had. We look at his, his racing success. We look at... Um, Everything that we can come up with, weather, we look at weather, we look at the track, we look at, at medication, we look at the necropsy exam. So all these factors are, are put into the mix. And then we, we try and come up with a, 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 a conclusion that either says, you know, this was a terrible tragedy and I really don't know what happened. You know, we don't know. This, this, is, this is, in 20 percent of the sudden cardiac deaths, we have no idea what happened. And we, we back into a diagnosis of a cardiac arrhythmias because that's not, it doesn't leave any evidence. There's no trace of an electrical disturbance. We can't find anything, and we just don't know. So there's some of these cases we just have no idea what happened. We have some situations where a horse might have an injury out in the racetrack. We don't know what happened. You know, maybe he stepped, you know, the old expression, he, stepped, he took a bad step. Well, why did he take a bad step? We may never know. But anyway, we try, and then what we do is we try, and, if we have information to share, we could say, you know, were you aware in the necropsy program we found this or that or this or that, and this is something that is very difficult to, for you to know about, but this is what was really responsible for this horse's injury. And uh, there's no way that we could expect you to know that that was there, that there's no blame here about you not knowing it was there, but then it falls back in my lap and says, well, we gotta figure out a way to get you the information so you do know this, those things are there. And we're gonna talk about that more this morning. But we use that for the Equine Safety Review Board. You are here to get information today. And it's great. And I'm really excited that you're here to do that. Because the information you're going to get here today, you won't get anyplace else. There's nobody that's going to share this information with you except us. Because we're working together to get this done. These are your horses. This is, these are your racetracks. These are your regulators. And this is your racing association. And we're working together on this stuff, but you're not going to get this information anyplace else. If you don't come to these meetings or go online to get this stuff, you're not going to have a clue about what's going on in some of these horses. 
but if you come here, you'll learn about that, and we can do some things together to maybe help make it better. Now, we also have two other options here. Um, there is an online possibility. You can get on this Jockey Club website, this Grayson Jockey Club website that you see down here. You can go online and do these courses online. There's one, the second hour today is going to be one that you could also get online from the Jockey Club. But that's a, that's a good place to get. You can do this at home. You can do this in your stable. You just have, all you need is a computer with online access. There's no charge to it. This is another website, the Thoroughbred Health Network in the United Kingdom. This is not designed to be necessarily a teaching tool, a continuing education program, but they've got great information here. What they do is they'll take a topic, like maybe it's upper airway disease, and they'll, they'll look at all the research that's been published on that topic, and then they grade the research as, this is really good research, you really need to know this, or they'll say, there's not a lot of evidence for this part, where they're saying this or saying that. It's okay, but it's, you know, there's some, some room for interpretation here. Or the third category would be, this stuff is garbage. You know, if you see this stuff, forget about it. It, does, it has no value. So it's a, it's a terrific um, filter, if you will, for you to look at some research and see what's going on with horses. If you're interested in learning more, that's a, a, another free source of information. So how can you use this information? Like, what do you do with all this stuff? You get this information, what do you do with it? Well, the first important thing is, is you really need to know your horses. I don't need to tell you that. You know your horses better than I know your horses. You will always know your horses better than I know your horses, and that'll never change. That's the way it's supposed to be. So, but you really need to dig in a little bit because I can tell you in our equine safety review board meetings, when we commonly interview trainers about a horse's exercise history, there's a lot of blank spaces blank spaces because the horse has changed hands primarily. And that in years past, you may have no idea that this horse had previous surgery for condor fractures, he's got two screws in his left front leg. You know, you may look at a program and see there was a gap there in the program. You think, well, I don't know what's that all about. But that's the point. You need to be looking at things like that and try and learn as much as you can from, about your horses. Understand that the risk of injury is not uniformly distributed among all horses. In your barn, Every horse is not at the same risk of injury. Some of your horses are more likely to get injured than others. Which ones? How do you know? And if you did know, what would you do about it? That's what we're talking about here. So it's important, it's very important to, to diagnose things. There is a tendency among all horsemen and veterinarians to think that lameness is the problem. You know, why is this horse on the vet's list? He's unsound. But that's not a diagnosis. It's really critical that you understand that. Lameness is a symptom. And if you treat it symptomatically, sometimes that'll work. It'll get better for a while. But if you don't address, if there's an underlying problem that isn't going to get better on its own, and if you don't address that problem, that horse will never be safe you know, as he moves forward in his training. So it's important that everybody understand that lameness is a sign of an underlying problem that you have to get a diagnosis on. And, and one of the more common causes of death at the racetrack is where uh, uh, decisions are made that this horse is unsound, and probably not, none of these horses are, are greatly unsound. They're, they're stiff or they're sore. They're, they're turned out for a little while. Dr. Green, which is a great thing for the most part. But without a diagnosis, when you bring them back, some of those horses, I can tell you at least one of them this past year, uh, was turned out because they, they thought the horse had bad shins. The horse probably did have shins. Okay, so the horse needed to be turned out. It was turned out for a little while, maybe a month or six weeks. They brought it back in and did an easy breeze, another breeze, and a second or third breeze, the horse broke its humerus on the training track. Now, that horse had a humeral fracture way back when, but it was never diagnosed. So it's just an example that there are conditions that you have to figure out, and sometimes it's hard to do that. Sometimes you need a bone scan to figure out that kind of thing. But, but it's, it's important to know that you have to do your best to try and figure out what's going on. The pain medication deal... Bute, banamine, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, great stuff. I'm on some NSAIDs right this minute because I hurt myself the other day. I mean, we, we do it all the time. But it's important to understand that if a horse is, giving, is given, constantly given these medications, then you as a trainer have an additional challenge in knowing what his real level of soundness is because that medication is going to mask the clinical signs of inflammation. It's what it's supposed to do. It's what it does. It's a good thing. But if, it's, if there's an underlying undiagnosed condition and you do that and you keep them in training, then that horse is at increased risk of injury. Very important concept to understand. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about, we talked about focusing injuries. We're going to talk a little bit 
on the, the uh, biaxial sesamoid bone fractures. This is, this is the most common racing injury any place, and certainly is in New York. And we did some research looking at these horses where we looked at horses that had this fracture and then we, who died in a race or died after a race, we euthanized. Then we looked at two other horses from the same race as control horses. So these are horses that survived the race and we examined their exercise history and, and did the same kind of studies on this. And some interesting things we found out. We found that horses that have this kind of injury have fewer starts in their second and third year of racing. Now, when is that, okay? That's during their, usually their three and four year old year. They had fewer starts. Why would a horse have fewer starts in, in what's literally the, the, probably the most lucrative part of his career where he can you know, participate in racing and, and be successful? Typically, it's because he's not sound enough to do so. There's something in the way. That ordinarily, this is not the time when you give your horse time out. You know, this is a time when ordinarily the commercial process is telling us this is where we want to compete and race. So these horses don't compete as much as the normal horses do. They have, actually, they have fewer high-speed furlongs in the 12 weeks leading up to the injury. So they're, they're, being, they're being slightly rested. They're, something's going on. So the horse is not working as hard as he ordinarily would. So he's not working as hard during that period. He has increased rest weeks in the eight weeks leading up to the injury. So something, again, there's some recognition that all is not right in the state of Dover here, but there's some changes going on. And they drop in two race classes. That's the odds ratio that happening is almost three. So a horse that drops two classes between races before this injury, that's, that's almost a uh, three horses three times as likely is what that means to have one of these fatal injuries as not. So that's a, those are some very interesting things that we found in our study that I'd like to share with you. This is another one that's really, really important. Now this is something that, that I'm, I'm confident it's impossible for you to know about this, but this is a piece of research that we're just getting ready to publish that shows that people have for years said that exercise-induced injuries are associated with increased exercise intensity. The more you work, the harder you work, the more likely you are to get hurt. It's logical, right? But it's not exactly true for a horse's, horse's whole career, because I looked at that. I looked at these high-speed furlongs from the very first moment they start to the moment they die, compared the, the dead horses with the horses that survived, and they're the same, almost. Almost exactly the same for their whole lifetime. But, 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 if you look at the time between their first start and their first recorded workout, very specific interval, first official workout, first start, that period of time alone, take everything else away, and then you measure high-speed furlongs in that period of time, we found a positive association, you see this chart on the right here, that we found a positive association over here, and it's hard to see the little red dot, I apologize. But anyway, you can see that the line goes up. In a probability curve, that's a probability curve, if the line's going up, it means the more things that are going on there, the more likely it is to get hurt. And at the bottom, what we're measuring there is high-speed furlongs to first start. So if you look at the numbers on the left, these are probabilities of injury, and the, the line starts at about 50%. 0.5 is 50% chance of having an, a biaxial proximal sesamoid bone fracture early in your career when the high-speed furlong numbers are really low. It can still happen, but it's not li really likely. However, if you look at the number 100 on there, if you have 100 high-speed furlongs before your first start, that horse has almost a 90% chance of having a biaxial proximal sesamoid bone fracture sometime in his career. 90%. That's a really bad odd, odds ratio, right? We had a horse here at Saratoga recently that was died before it's, you know, it, it's, uh, I guess it had one start, but very early in his career, had 92 high-speed furlongs. Had, took 38 weeks to get to, to get to the first start, which is a little long. Usually the average is about 20 weeks to, from when you had your first recorded workout to your first start. Admittedly, there's some error there because not every workout is recorded, as you know, especially if it's in Europe and none of them are recorded. But the point is here, that's a very sensitive interval. So if, if, you, if you have training records that indicate some of your horses in your barn, maybe you're having a little hard time getting them to the races, and if they've got 90 or 100 high-speed furlongs under their belt, that's a really a horse that really needs to be looked at. Now, here, now, what do we do with that data? We're not talking about eliminating that horse from competition. We're not talking about saying you can't enter him, but that's a horse that you need to get looked at. That's a horse that probably needs a CAT scan of his fetlocks to see what the, what the bone changes are going on in there. But that's a trigger point for that. It's a very important diagnostic in finding. I wanted to share some of the things that we see in there. We talk about pre-existing injuries, and these are, are common things that we find here. And the two most common pre-existing injuries that we have are cartilage damage and subchondral bone sclerosis. 
and these are very important things. The slide on the left here, that you'll see that, that you have one that's labeled left, one that's labeled R. It's the bottom of a cannon bone. The one on the left has got some fairly normal spots in it, but you can see the large erosive lesions on the one on the left. That's severe cartilage erosion. The cartilage is almost completely worn through in the center of that cannon bone. The one on the right, you can see more lines on it. Those are called score lines. You can see them because there's hemorrhage in there. There's score lines on the one on the left as well, but, but that's not the one. The horse broke the right ankle. Biaxial sesamoid bone fracture on the right side, so that's where the blood came from. If we, if we look at these, these are the lesions on the left side. And the important thing is here that, that this is why it's very hard. I can't tell you how many people said to me, Doc, I just don't get it. That was a very sound horse. He wasn't lame. If he was lame, I wouldn't have put him in. Okay, granted. The reason why he's not lame is because he's got the same problem in both legs. And so lameness is a gait asymmetry where you have, a, you have a, a pebble in your shoe or the horse has got an abscess in the foot and he's head nodding lame, you know. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a horse with a, with a medical condition in both front legs that causes pain in both front legs. So the horse, is got, what's he going to have? He's going to have a choppy gait. He's going to have a stiff gait. He's going to look like he's got a sore back or sore feet. You're not going to have any idea this is going on in there unless you do some, some advanced imaging on them. So there's some real challenges with figuring this out, you know, and making it, you know, obvious to, that we can figure this stuff out in horses before they get hurt. But that's just an example of why these horses are not lame, okay? So they're often both front or back. That's usually sometimes more than that. They can be off in all four legs. But this is on the left-hand slide here. That's the biaxial sesamoid bone, bone fracture that was in the right front fetlock. But that horse also had a lot of pre-existing cartilage damage. There was a lot of wear and tear in that joint, but it was just nobody knew. And, it, you know, nobody had any idea it was there. And it's hard to find it. This is another example. And this is what we call subchondral bone sclerosis. On the picture on the left, it, it looks you know, pretty irregular down there at the bottom, but, but what we have here with this yellow arrow on the left is an area of intense bone sclerosis. Bone, for the most part, has trabecular patterns in it. It's like a sponge. So there's struts of bone and then there's air in between, kind of like a sponge. If you took a sponge and looked at it, you could see air spaces and you could see the other parts of the sponge. That's good because it has shock absorbing value. It's designed to manage the stress of, uh, that we place on it. If the bone gets really brittle, and gets remodeled so it's like a little brick. It's very brittle and very, very likely to fracture, and, and you're going to hear more about that uh, from Dr. Cresswell and Dr. Resink on the third hour. But that's what's going on in this horse's cannon bone. That's why he broke his cannon bone. It was going to happen. We just didn't know when. And then, but look over here on the right side. The arrow points out he had a condor fracture in his other leg as well. It wasn't broken through. It was incomplete. But given another race or so, if he'd have survived the one on the other side, he would have broke that one. So it's very common to find things like this. And, and again, we'd never know this if we didn't do the necropsy program. These are the things that we've learned from that. Cartilage injury um, and chronic pathology. This is a combination of two things. This, if you look on the left, you can see score lines in the bottom of the cannon bone, just like we saw before. And on the right, you can see a complete acute disruption of the distal sesmodian ligaments. Those are the XYZ ligaments. And this horse had ongoing degenerative changes in that joint but he ripped his suspensory ligaments in the other leg, and that's what broke him down. So it's an example of how they're shifting weight back and forth. I'm sure you're familiar with that concept, but we've been able to document that with the necropsy program. So this pre-existing pathology is really where we want to focus, and identifying horses with pre-existing pathology is the, the key to being able to intervene before these horses die. That's really the, the take-home point there. But we have to be able to figure this out, and it's not easy to do that. This is, another, this is a stress fracture I mentioned to you about a humeral stress fracture. This is a horse, if we look on the picture on the left, that white arrow is pointing to a bony callus, okay? That callus tells us that this horse had a stress fracture there that just opened up and this horse resumed training. This was the horse that was turned out for sore shins. And he had this fracture, but nobody knew about it. So again, that's an example of, of the importance of, of getting a diagnosis. Now, so how do, what are we going to do about this? I mean, how do we move forward with this? It's, it's one thing for me to, to share this information with you, but if I can't find it and you can't find it, where does that leave us? I mean, do we just have to say, okay, we're, we know it's there, but we're going to have to just live with this risk? I don't think so. I think we're, we're committed as veterinarians to try and help you do a better job of finding that out and how to deal with it. Because once it gets to this point, this is a picture of a very advanced stage. Once the bone gets, gets 
damaged like that, it can never be normal again. Never. If we identify the process early on, turning the horse out with some active exercise, the bone can remodel and be healthy again. So that's our only opportunity to, to, to save these horses for racing. Otherwise, we're just stuck with the, with the resolution that we have to retire them if we don't want to kill them. It's a, it's a very tough situation, it really is. So how we do this? Well, if we, we, we're all familiar with digital radiography, and, and we've come a long way with digital radiography. And we know that if we take special views of the fetlock joint, multiple views of the fetlock joint, that we can see edges of the bones and help us to identify horses that might have some of these problems. For example, this is a digital radiograph of what we call a dorsopalmar view. It's a view from the front to the back. It's not named after me. It's P-A-L-M-A-R. Just getting that out there. I had nothing to do with it. But when you shoot that, that, that down angle, it lifts the sesamoids up away from the fetlock joint so you can really see what's going on with the fetlock joint and the sesamoids. Because if we overlap all these bones, it's harder to see you know, exactly what's happening. So that's a no pretty normal radiograph. Okay. Now, here's another radiograph of the same horse from a different angle. And would you, qual would you characterize that as a normal radiograph? What do you think? Normal or abnormal? Raise your hand if you think it's okay. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's not okay. The rest of you are kind of in the middle ground here, not quite so sure. Or maybe you just don't want to commit. <laughs> I understand that. Okay, well, what we have here, that's, that's not a normal radiograph, but it's, a, it's, it's something that is very common that we find that you can diagnose with a digital radiograph. And you see the arrow here is pointing to a little divot on the back of the cannon bone. And the back of that cannon bone is really white. This part of the cannon bone where the arrow is pointing is whiter than the rest of the bottom of the cannon bone. And then right in the back there, there's a divot, okay? Now what that represents is the whiteness represents the sclerosis. The divot represents the fact that the sclerosis is so advanced that the articular cartilage has collapsed. The bone underneath of it's been necrotic and it's soft and it's collapsed because it can't stand up to the strain. So we've actually got an articular defect there. This is a horse that's too far down the road for you to fix or for me to fix or for anybody to fix. So if you see a radiograph like this, it's, it's too far gone for fixing, but it's also probably not a good horse to race. You know, it's a, it's a dangerous horse to race. Now, this is not that horse, but this is what that bone would look like if you sliced it and looked at that. So this is like comparing the radiograph with the physical change. You can see that, that dark, the, the whitishness, and you actually see some new blood vessels growing into the bottom of that cannon bone. That's what that looks like if you cut into it. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to come up with a, with a program uh, that would help us identify these horses before they get hurt. Now, this is a lot like screening for cancer or screening for a serious disease in human medicine. And what it means is we need to find screening tools where we can pick up on these things and give you an idea about what's going on before it gets really bad. Now, the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at our exercise history because we know that there are certain exercise history patterns that are associated with this kind of injury. We, they're serum biomarkers. When the, the body is making these changes in the bone, they release chemicals that we can measure. But that's, that's uh, probably would add a lot to our predictive ability. Uh, Tim Parkin told me that he feels that we can predict with 65% accuracy, just using exercise history alone, of horses that are going to die of fatal musculoskeletal injury. But I said to him, Tim, that's not good enough. Because we'd be scratching, if we were talking about not letting these horses race, we'd be scratching 35% of our racing population, and that's not going to happen, and we don't need to do that for a number of reasons, because this is not accurate all the time. So we can improve the accuracy by using serum biomarkers, but there's some challenges with that. What about the pre-race inspections? All these horses get looked at before they run. Can't we find this stuff in a pre-race inspection? The answer is no, we can't. Then the next step is, well, what about imaging? We've got digital radiography, nuclear scintigraphy, MRIs, and CTs, CAT scans. Well, are those good screening tools? Eh, not really. Because a good screening tool has to be what? It has to be readily available, it has to be inexpensive, and it has to be accurate. Those are the criteria for a good screening test. The blood tests are really just not ready for prime time. We are working on these markers. We've been working on them for about 15 years. And the fact that we're still not here ready to tell you how to use them would tell you that it's probably not going to happen quickly. So if we're waiting for bone markers to save the day, that's not going to happen. We don't have time for that. The next part is the pre-race inspection findings. Well, what about that pre-race inspection finding process? There was a paper published uh, quite a few years ago that showed, in, it was done in Kentucky, that any abnormality of the suspensory ligament or the superficial digital flexor tendon was associated with injury in the racetrack. Not necessarily a fracture, but 
aggravation of those conditions. Dr. Mary Scalabe made this comment in 2012, I like it a lot, it says the appearance of unsoundness should not be equated with musculoskeletal health, okay? The, the problem with the race day exam is the risk of the illusion of soundness. I guess it's actually the appearance of soundness. So I apologize, that's my bad on there. But the point is that a horse can look sound on race day and he's not really safe. That's, those things are not equivalent. Now, is that to say that the pre-race examination is not doing its job or that it's not helping us? That's not true at all. It's not saying that at all. It's just saying that it's not a guarantee. There are no guarantees and that horses can have these problems and they can pass a pre-race exam, we can't guarantee that they won't have that. Now, what we can say about pre-race examinations, this is really, really important. This is data that Dr. Scully did in Florida a number of years ago. She took about 400 horses that were scratched out of a race and then compared those horses afterwards with horses that were sound during the race, okay? And what she found was that in scratched horses, 77% of them did start within six months of being scratched, okay? The 93% of them started within a year of being scratched. But the interval to the next race was 83 days from the race in which they were scratched to their next start. In the control horses, 97% started within six months, 99 started within a year, and the mean interval of the race was 34 days. So the difference of 34 days versus 83 days tells you that this process is working. These, these exams are identifying horses that shouldn't be running. But, there, but again, it's no guarantee. So is it valuable? Absolutely. Do we find things that save horses' lives? Absolutely. And you know, the, I wanna also you know, make it clear something here about it just because a horse has a problem in the pre-race exam doesn't mean that the trainer somehow failed to recognize this. I mean, things can happen between the pre-race exam and the race. I mean, the conditions can change. The horse can change over periods of time. So it's not, don't consider it an indictment. I mean, I guess ideally, we would figure these things out before they even enter, but it's no, not always the case. That horse could be fine at the time you enter him, and then what the previous exam might be three to five days later, right? With given the box the way it is, so things can happen. You know, they can aggravate stuff. So just be aware that that, um, in my opinion, anyway, a horse that's scratched during a previous exam is not a criticism of the trainer. You know, it's not not in my book. It, we're, again, we're all working together on this stuff. If you look at the uh, advanced imaging, now we're going to talk about CAT scan and MRI. This is a, a STIR MRI image, and what that means is that this black stuff that you see up there is going to correlate with increased bone density. So you look at that sesamoid and look at the end of that cannon bone. Really black, right, compared to the rest of the bones. Well, that's great, except that's about a, anywhere from well, around a $2,000 bill to get that picture. So because of that, that's, it's not a screening tool. That's a diagnostic tool. So we need something else to get us to that point because we can't spend that kind of money on horses just as a screening tool. Well, what if we could do this with regular digital radiography? You know, a digital radiography exam might cost $150, $200 for a couple of views. I mean, that's the, the price of a joint injection. I mean, it's, if we could do that, that would be a good screening tool because it would be inexpensive and everybody's got a digital radiograph, you know, available to them. So, but we can't easily do that. These are two pictures of two different horses. These are age match controls. One of these horses has a condylar fracture. One of them is normal. Now, you're not gonna get any other views because the condylar fracture won't show up on this view, but you can look at the bone and see if you see a difference between these two horses. And we've been talking about bone density. Let's think about bone density. Does one of this horse look at has, like it has more dense bone than another one? Maybe, right? So if you were gonna say, how many of you would say that the, the picture on top has is, is got more bone density than the picture on the bottom? Okay, how many would say the one on the bottom's got more bone density than the one on the top? So mostly you're saying the top one is the broken leg, right? Based on bone density, well let's look. So this is called a histogram. A histogram is a mathematical tool that we use to measure something. Now you gave me your optical impression of bone density and said the top one is more dense, right? So what we have here is a measure of that density because we have a special piece of software. We can take that image, that radiograph you're looking at, and we can circle an area of interest on it, have a computer analyze it, and the computer will, will separate that image into two, every pixel, like there's thousands of pixels in that area, right, like a TV set? It'll, it'll compartmentalize that. It'll say that, that, that out of 256 shades of gray, it'll say there are so many shade, so many pixels are in this shade, so many pixels are in that shade, they put them in these little bins. So that if we had a white piece of paper there or a bone, or a, or a bone plate up there, a piece of steel, this would be all white and that would be a very narrow 
uh, histogram. In other words, the base of it would be narrow. The more variation you have in color from black to white, you're going to have a wider base at the bottom because there's more variation in the distribution of the pixel colors. So that's the top one. Here's the bottom one. Do they look the same to you? No, they're not the same. And actually, mathematically, we can calculate the difference and, and measure it very accurately. So we can take a normal, we can take a regular digital radiograph and we can apply this technology to it and measure brightness or density, and we can say that the top bone is more dense than the bottom bone, okay? The top bone is the one with the broken leg. So it's just an example of some new technology we're looking at that can maybe give you an economical way to figure this out before bad things happen. Now, FRAX is what the goal is eventually, is, is FRAX is a tool developed by the World Health Organization to help estimate the risk of human beings going in nursing homes. I'm hoping that I'm a little way away from that, and I hope that you are too. But someday, if we get into these old folks' homes, they want to know what the chances are of us falling out of bed and breaking our hip. They want to know that because there's a lot of money involved in taking care of people, and they want to figure that out. So they've got this protocol to do that. They use a, a dual scan CT to measure bone mass score. That's a, that's a bone density measurement. And then they also have a, a questionnaire that you have to answer a bunch of questions about do you smoke, do you drink, do you do this, do you do that? And then they calculate from those answers to those questions in this bone measurement what your likelihood is to have a pelvic, a, a pelvic fracture in a nursing home or wherever within 10 years. So we're not going to go quite that route. We're going to use something similar to hopefully give you as trainers an idea about if we did a bone scan or bone estimate of bone density, we got that number, and we have a, a list of risk factors you could check off as being present or absent, then maybe we could give you an idea about the likelihood of injury of all the horses in your barn. So that's, that's kind of where we're headed with this. Um, but what have we learned, just to wrap this up, what have we learned about this post-mortem examination program? What's the take-home message? Well, you can say, well, we learned that the fetlock joint is where we need to be working. That's great. That's true. But the most important thing that we learned, if you look at this chart, between 2010 and 2015, the national fatality rate is in red, the Naira fatality rate is in white. Now, from 2010 through 2012, Naira's fatality rate was just about the same as the national fatality rate. A little bit above, a little bit below, probably about the same. But if you look at 13, 14, and 15, the Naira fatality rate's been less than the national fatality rate consistently. Actually, the, next, the last four years, it's been below the national fatality rate. Okay? How come? How come? Tim Parkins said that... Um, well, basically, it's been down 48% if you look at the numbers here. But the real question is, why, why is that? And it's because we've been using this information, and, and you've been working hard, I've been working hard, Naira's been working hard, everybody's been working hard, the commission is doing their best, to, to minimize the risk in all these horses, and it's paying off. Because our fatality rate is better than the national average, and has been for the last four years. That's not an accident. That's a tribute to you and everybody else that's been working on this so hard. What this, what this really means is, let's not pat ourselves on the back just yet, but let's, what this really means is we do not have to accept the national fatality rate or, or the business as usual as it used to be, because we, you, I, us, we, have the, we are empowered to make a difference. The work that we've done in the last four years shows that we have the potential to reduce fatalities. It's not going to be a perfect day, day every day. Horses are still going to get hurt but we're doing better than anybody else, and we're doing better than we ever did before. So that's something to really keep in mind, that, that this is important information, and, and that's, this is the core of, of what we've taken home from it. So we, we, a couple of quick things, though, we, we, and we already know some of the stuff is, it, I think every piece of science that we publish has to resonate with you and say, well, that's reasonable. I get that. It makes sense to me, because if it doesn't, then there's something wrong. But I think you, we can all say horses can break their legs any time. It's not like they do it when they're old and decrepit. That's not the deal. Some do it very young, some do it in the old, some do it in between. Fetlock injuries are absolutely number one. Pre-existing bone and joint problems predispose these horses to injuries, and that these issues often are not, these horses are not unsound. So it's very difficult to figure that out beforehand. What you can do is make sure you really dig in and learn about your horses, learn everything you can about your horses, because that's what it's going to take to figure these things out. Understand that horses can be lame in more than one leg, it's, and for that reason, you've got to pay attention to those horses that are stiff, sore, have sore backs, sore feet. Could be for another reason. Don't, rule, don't just dismiss it. Get a veterinary diagnosis. You know, you have to have a diagnosis if you're going to fix it. 
Otherwise, it's, you're going to just treat it symptom, symptomatically, and that predisposes the horse to injury. And NSAIDs heads are great, but just be careful you don't give them all the time. Just make sure that you have a time frame which you can properly evaluate your horse's soundness. And this is why this is important for a lot of really good reasons, a lot of really good reasons. But you know, it's a big deal here in New York. We're talking about a $4.2 billion industry, 33,000 jobs. And if we don't get this squared away, we're in peril. I know you know that. I know we've got demonstrators out here on the weekends. We're going to have a demonstrator bunch out here on Saturday, next Saturday. You know, there's a lot of pressure from all sorts of areas. Racing is under a microscope, especially at Saratoga. So it's really critical that we work, do everything that we can to get this squared away as best we can. So the first hour was just tonight to kind of give you what's going on with these horses and the fact that, yes, we can do something about it and give you some priorities to think about in terms of areas we need to be working on to get moving with this, to be successful.